Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this talk on the music for the indie games Florence and Necro Barista. Boom, here we go. So, uh, my name is Kevin Penkin. I am a composer that's based here in Melbourne, but I have just finished living in London for the last six years. Uh, I was over there originally to study a master's degree in composition for screen at the Royal College of Music, and after finishing there, it was not my uh, immediate desire to return to my hometown of uh, Perth, so I stayed on for <laughs> Perth represent, but it, you know I wasn't ready. <laughs> um, so I stayed on in London for a couple of years, and I moved here in June of this year. Uh, during this time in London, I wrote music for not just video games, but also for Japanese anime. Uh, this started originally through games, writing additional music for the uh, Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu. Not for any of the actual Final Fantasy games, I wish, but uh, it did lead. These uh, small to medium sized games that I did additional music for uh, sort of led to a few contacts who had a presence in both the Japanese and anime industry. I bring this up because the uh, quote unquote style of anime music uh, is something that influenced how I approached one of the games we'll be talking about today, which is uh, Necro Barista. Just a few housekeeping requests before we continue. Some of this material is uh, a little sensitive and isn't ready for public consumption, so uh, please don't video or audio record this talk. Uh, I really like my job and I don't want to get fired. Thank you. Um, anyway, so I stayed in London for a few years and ended up essentially falling into the anime industry. Uh, and I was always a really, really keen on anime. Uh, I love, you know, Ghost in a Shell, Akira, Earth Maiden Arjuna, Pingu. <laughs> uh, anyone who uses the website My Anime List will know why that's a funny or very, very not funny joke, because <laughs> it's actually converted one of the best anime of all time. I'm not joking. Um, the level of influence was you know, equal when it came to games as well. You know, Metro Prime, Shadow of the, of the Colossus, uh, Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, Halo, uh, Pingu, the PC game. I'm just kidding. It looks horrible and I will stop with the pingo shit now. Um, uh, but uh, what was an interesting cross-section for all these different games was how completely and utterly unique every soundtrack was. And like the composers, it's almost like the composers kind of figured out the DNA of the game and then put it into audio form. Uh, admittedly, I didn't realize this at the time, but eventually I realized uh, that it was because of a few key but often kind of subtle features, and each of these soundtracks would, and they would execute these small features really, really well. Um, let's say if we listen to a little bit of uh, Halo, we instantly recognize that theme. It's the classic Gregorian unison melody reminiscent of a, of a time that has passed. Now, apart from the obvious buzzwords that could be go away, thank you, Halo. <laughs> apart from the obvious buzzwords that could be associated with that sort of theme and sound, things like church-like, spiritual, ancient, uh, I wanted to suggest another word, which is extinct. Gregorian chants aren't actually extinct; they're sung actually all the time. But unless that's the sort of style of music that you're kind of really into, or you know, you listen to them on a regular basis because it's part of your religion, it's somewhat unlikely that you're actually going to hear that type of music on a regular basis. What does that mean in the context of something like Halo? It means you could take an existing style of music, even with predetermined real-world associations, and imprint it onto something else. Let's look at the context of Halo, for example. It's a giant ring made by an extinct race called the Forerunners that created an ancient technology that would become a fundamental part of the storytelling mechanic in the world of Halo. I'm of the opinion that the Halo music wasn't only successful because it it wasn't only successful because it was a damn cool theme, but the composer in question saw associations with how the Halo ring was a spiritual and technological masterpiece for its time, found a musical comparable in the real world, 
and used it to sonically depict a core storytelling mechanic. If that is true, I think that's pretty fucking cool. Shadow of the Colossus, uh, one of my favorite games, is exactly the same. It's a game about fighting giant monsters in a forgotten and ancient land, and your quest is centralized around a cathedral or church that you respawn to after completing a mission, which is to kill one of these giant creatures that you see on the screen. Uh, if we listen to some of the music of Shadow of the Colossus, uh, you'll see that the composer is using pipe organ and liberal use of reverb to recreate a, a sound aesthetic of a real world church. I also want you to pay close attention to the harmonic and contrapuntal writing in the second half of this main theme, uh, which is going to be an important to touch on after we finish listening. into a little deeper about what just happened. Um, why I think this soundtrack works so well, and to properly explain why the soundtracks I've mentioned so far have any relation to uh, Necrobarista and Florence, uh, we need to look at not just how maybe texturally um, uh, uh, music can be used as a, a storytelling mechanic, say with the Gregorian chants, but we should also look at other elements of music, uh, namely harmony. And it's important to see how harmony specifically functions in a way that provokes a physical representation of the world that the music is written for. Particularly one quick song, uh, which is played after you kill one of these you know, giant, colossal creatures. And what basically happens is I want to highlight in this particular cue the way that the harmony goes from minor to major. It's something called a Picardy third, and Picardy third, for anyone who doesn't uh, 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 no, is basically a when you end on a major chord when a minor chord is expected. For example, instead of a cadence in the next track uh, ending on a G minor chord, it's going to end on a G major chord, and will contain the notes uh, and and basically contain a, a raised third essentially to make it major. This technique is first used widely in the Renaissance era of mu music and later in the Baroque era as well. And so I think this actually perfectly matches the sort of aesthetic, the era aesthetic that the, uh, and especially the church aesthetic that this game is actually trying to go for, especially when you consider that there are spiritual and church-like sort of themes that come throughout the actual game. Also the use of the 
the use of uh, choir, pipe organ, and strings. They're also uh, very, very accurate to the strings that uh, to the instruments that would have been used actually in that era as well, the real world era of the Renaissance and the rock. So it's this sort of attention to detail that convinces me that composers of Shadow, Colossus, Shadow of the Colossus and Halo, they must have had, at least on some level, some level, the intention to derive musical parameters from the world that they were instructed to represent or even recreate sonically. So how does this all uh, relate to Florence and Necrobarista? Let's dive into that. Florence is a game created by Studio Mountains here in Melbourne uh, that ended up winning a few awards, which of course is very nice, uh, including a BAFTA for Mobile Game of the Year, which was, which was very, very nice. The game was created in Melbourne and set in Melbourne, and you can see from these pictures that we get a very sort of comic book style approach to the art with a very specific color palette, very clean, very simple, but deliberate and intimate. Remember this word intimate for, uh, for later. Uh, I'm going to quote a plot summary here for context, but essentially the game follows uh, Florence, a 25-year-old woman who lives alone and is settled into a uh, sort of monotonous routine of working at her job and mindlessly interacting with social media on her phone. One morning her phone dies and she follows the sound of a cello and sees Krish. Krish is a street performer, and uh, they befriend each other, they go on some dates, they kiss for the first time, and they start taking their relationship to the next level. Uh, they move in together, pursued by, and they sort of pursue their dreams of uh, Krish becoming a cellist. Uh, the couple have their first fight six months into the relationship in a grocery store, and after a year, they've fallen into a routine, begin to drift apart, have another big fight, break up, and then eventually Florence decides to quit her monotonous job and pursue a career as a, uh, as a uh, painting, as a painter. Uh, as, a, as a painting, she wants to become a painting. <laughs> impressive, very impressive, very ambitious. <laughs> and of course she, she starts finding success, and the, but the cost of her finding success is that she has to let go of Krish. That's the basic, basic summary of, of Florence, without the painting. Uh, this is Necrobrista, and this is an up-and-coming game developed by Route 59, again, based here in Melbourne. And importantly, it's also set in Melbourne. The game is about how the dead and the living meet in a uh, Melbourne cafe and have one last cup of coffee together before passing on. Uh, the game revolves around the idea of time. Uh, each character who's dead, uh, who's stuck in this sort of purgatory cafe, has uh, two hours of time to enjoy their last cup of coffee. However, they can gamble with the other uh, dead characters uh, in the cafe to gain more time on their clock. So the use of time is clearly uh, a very important storytelling aspect to this game. Um, this is sort of the sensitive part of the presentation, so no recording please. But um, I'm going to play you the two ending tracks actually from both Necrobrista and Florence. Uh, both use the core emotional approach of letting go. Uh, the scenes in both of these games have their own context, and, but however, both tracks are basically composed using the exact same technique employed by uh, each other, uh, by, by both uh, Halo and Shadow of the Colossus, of trying to distill physical parameters from the game into the emotional context and the audio context. So this is the uh, ending theme for Florence.
and the uh, final track for Necro Brewster. So as mentioned before, both these games use the same compositional technique here, which is to break down the parameters of the game, whether they be stylistic, location-based, aesthetic-based, or story-based. And the idea is, as I said, translate these factors into musical ideas. Florence, as I mentioned before, is a game about intimacy. So if I, were if I, if I was to try and translate that keyword into music, uh, how would we go about that? And uh, for me, the answer actually was a little, a little simple, which was uh, that it's an Australian-made game, and it's set physically in Australia. So naturally, it would make sense that the music would be recorded in, in Australia as well, specifically my hometown of Perth, actually. Woo! And <laughs> good old Perth. Um, I found that you know, creating these sorts of connections uh, between not only the audience, but also my team members and ultimately myself, it was an incredibly productive way of going about the creative process. And when I saw that Studio Mountains were making a really, really intimate and personal game, I felt like I had to do something that was intimate and personal to me to match what they were doing. Uh, these are some of the images from the recording session uh, of Florence. This is uh, Noel. Uh, I've known Noel since about 2011, and we went to the uh, West Australian Academy of Performing Arts together, or WAPA, as people know it. Around the same time, uh, I also uh, knew uh, this person, Sophie. She's an unbelievable cellist who I've worked with many, many times with the uh, Perth Symphony Orchestra. Uh, Rachel, the violinist, exactly the same. Uh, the flute player was uh, someone called Diane, and she actually taught me flute when I was a kid. Uh, and uh, I, I knew the clarinet player from Whopper as well, and even the mixing engineer, uh, his name is Matt McLean, and he's one of my best friends, and um, I think we've known each other almost a decade, and he's a pretty awesome composer as well, just for the record. Um, I show you these people because, apart from my wonderful agent uh, and best friend, uh, that's the entire team. It's a small team of musicians who I've known for a long time, and the piano is sometimes literally representing the main character, Florence, on screen. And the cello is sometimes literally representing Krish on the screen as well. Uh, I do want to take a moment to show you one of the levels, uh, the actual gameplay of one of the levels in Florence, uh, so you can see how this approach to the word intimacy is combined in both the gameplay and also the music. Um, the video I found on YouTube, uh, it does have some occasional commentary, which actually is somewhat apt, so it actually works quite well, but I'm just going to very quickly sneak over here to Safari, and we are connected to the internet, and here we go. Are you playing? Thank you. 
<laughs> like I said, pretty pretty apt commentary. <laughs> um, right, so with Necrobarista, right? See if this sounds a little familiar to what I just said. Necrobarista is an Australian-made game set physically in Australia, so naturally it would make sense that the music would be recorded in Australia as well. It shares the same fundamental characteristics that I look for as a composer and, of course, as an Australian as well, uh, and that serves as inspiration for the basis of the music. Where Necrobarista is different for me is uh, two key categories, art and cultural influence. Florence and Necrobarista study the different type of relationships one has with themselves, with others, and uh, with the coming of terms, with you know, life's challenges or death's challenges in this case. Uh, and they have fundament fundamentally different approaches to the visual art as well. Necro Necrobarista's art is uh, 3D, and it has, it's also a very uh, heavily dialogue-based game, uh, whereas Florence has almost no actual dialogue. Uh, and it leans into different influences for the uh, animated art as well, uh, namely anime, <laughs> which is why I came on in the first place. Um, for the record, this is not an actual anime. I think that's Sailor Moon or something, that's, and someone's done something really messed up to it. But I thought it was funny, <laughs> and I'll just, you know, point your nightmares for the, rest of the, uh, for the rest of the week, so you're welcome. Anyway, uh, Necro Barista has influences from anime, Melbourne coffee culture, hipster culture, and uh, musically, it has influences from modern dance and pop music, which means that even though the same, uh, uh, this is the same approach to, to making music uh, for both games uh, and deriving uh, you know, musical parameters from the physical world of the game, uh, the result is and can be completely and utterly different. For example, The big difference between the music of Florence and Necrobarista is that with Necrobarista I was kind of instructed to occasionally make uh, the music sound like it was a dance track or an EDM club banger. Uh, the only problem with that is that I can't produce dance music for shit. <laughs> I can write it, I can envision it, uh, but I can't produce it, or at least I can't produce it to a level that I would be satisfied with. Uh, so in the same way that I didn't play like cello on vi uh, or violin or clarinet or even piano on Florence, uh, I collaborated this time on Necrobarista with a producer by the name of Jeremy Lim. Uh, Jeremy basically does everything that I don't. Uh, he's an extremely talented producer, mixing engineer, and of course he's also a fantastic composer. Uh, Jeremy w was brought in to basically make Necrobarista sound essentially, you know, in layman's terms, like a track that you would hear on Triple J. Uh, in its essence. Uh, so I know uh, Fabian, who was the uh, best friend and uh, agent who I mentioned before, he knew that trying to achieve this type of sound with just me, uh, when it wasn't in my arsenal of tricks, uh, it was just not going to work out. And rather than submit a soundtrack that was going to be under par, I'd rather work with someone else and, and have them bring their expertise in, into, the, uh, 
into the production. So that's why Jeremy was brought in. Um, and that leads me into one of the main points I want to kind of touch on today, which is um, I wanted to bring up today about your personal limitations, knowing what's going on, what project is going to be like the best for you to take on. It's really, really important because if I showed you what I produced and then what Jeremy did, I think you'd be kind of shocked actually. Um, and as they say in TV, here's one I prepared earlier. So this is my good old Logic Profile. Um, on the left, you will see we have my, my music. Well, it's still my music, but um, basically, uh, I'm going to show you what I composed and then would be okayed by the team and then produced. Uh, so we'll have uh, start with uh, my project right here. Oh. Hey, some, this is not playing. Good old audio running. Thank you, Logic Pro. Uh, audio. Very good. Let's try that. And then this is what it sounds like when you employ someone who knows what they're doing. better <laughs> properly mixed <laughs> um, so even though the music of both Florence and Necrobarista are trying to physically represent the world they occupy and even though it's kind of funny that they're both created and based in Melbourne the aesthetic result is entirely different uh, even though musically or emotionally they're saying the exact same thing at sometimes 
Florence, you know, went the live musician route. Necro Barista used the remix artist producer route, and they both explore an aspect of life or death, uh, you know, in, in terms of relationships, uh, just in different ways, essentially, but it's cut from the same cloth. And the reason I am talking about this today is because I kind of want to encourage where appropriate this kind of scoring, because I have a I tend to have the opinion that not only does this kind of approach encourage the individual individuals like personality to come out with each composer, but you kind of I don't know I, I feel less stressed when I have to when I don't have to worry about style and sort of you can just literally make a style from the game's actual DNA. That's just my personal opinion, and obviously it's not going to work for everyone, and I don't recommend that it does. And there's also a huge room for hip, for hypocrisy, <laughs> which is nice. Um, but you know. I think it's fun to deep dive into what makes a game tick and, you know, trying to literally represent it sometimes in audio form. It's quite fun. Um, I did want to leave some time at the end uh, for questions and uh, maybe a little bit of an open discussion. Uh, I'm happy to expand on anything that you'd like to hear more about. I've got all the logic, logic profiles loaded up if, if there's any questions about that. Uh, the reason I'm uh, sort of not putting that part of it of, with the uh, sort of this part of the formal presentation is that, you know, being able to just bring up a specific track or a logic profile is um, maybe an easier way to answer any specific questions, if you have any. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And, um, And if, well, if there's no questions, that's all good as well. <laughs> but I was banking on that because I didn't write enough. <laughs> Sick. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he said A, Mike. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, my question. My question is. Um, if you're starting out, would you have any recommendations for starting out in in sound design sort of thing? You know, yeah, I mean, well, we, so starting point. Yeah, um, so we just had a um, a two day conference called High Score, um, which uh, sort of was uh, entirely music focused or sound focused, game audio focused, um, and uh, we discussed this issue. At, like, we asked, we discussed this question at length. Uh, you know, there's no like one way to get into you know writing for games, uh, the local scene here in Melbourne and the scene across Australia, I tend, like, I love. That's why I came back personally. Um, really good people here and really, really interesting games being made. Uh, you, you know, I mean, you're here, so you'll, you'll probably be meeting uh, people around. But one, one thing that I've kind of figured out as I've gone to a couple of conferences is that I tend to try and like to find one person, just one person a day that I actually, you know, really personally connect with, uh, whether they be a game developer or a fellow uh, audio artist or something like that. And, you know, just keep in contact with that one person. I mean, not to say ignore everybody else, but, you know, there's only so much RAM going up in here. So <laughs> it's like, you know, finding one person that you think that's going to, they're going to have a positive impact on your career in some way in the future. Finding that one person per day, I think, is a, is, a, is a good start in terms of these sorts of conferences. And then, you know, the general sort of industry thing is, you know, that there are things of game jams. You can contact people online if, 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 if you feel that's an appropriate sort of um, ap uh, approach to that person, if you know them or if you, th you think it would be a wise move. Uh, you know, that there's no one way in that this could be an entire lecture in itself. But what I would say, just for the long short of it, is... Um, Make friends. Make friends. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Sweet. Hi. Hiya. Um, I'm interested in about, um, before you started production of the music in Florence and in Necrobrist and the other ones, how much of an idea you had of the scope of how much you invest in creating the music because hiring studio musicians and audio engineers and people besides yourself to contribute to the soundtrack, was that more than what the game developers who hired you expected and did you kind of negotiate with them to increase your budget or is it something that they kind of came in with and expected up front? I mean we always have a, 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 a fairly frank discussion at the start of every project about what we think will be good in terms of scope mm. uh, for, uh, for a game. Uh, in, in the case of Florence and Necrobarista they didn't need some sort of large ensemble. In fact Necrobarista barely needed live musicians 
we did record a few um, small live musicians in Perth, right. classic. But <laughs> but um, you know Florence was going to be an acoustic soundtrack, so obviously uh, budgeting for uh, even just a small amount of live musicians, especially if it's in a, a region of the world where it's not you know ten grand a day for a room or something crazy like that. You know it's just a small studio and. Um, fuck nowhere in Australia, but um, <laughs> but um, you know you, you do need to have those sorts of conversations, especially if you know that it's going to a benefit the the project, which live uh, live yeah. musicians nearly always do. Secondly, you know the scope and how much it's going to cost, and just having making people, especially people that aren't familiar with the musical process, you know, feel comfortable and prepared for what is about to happen. Because once you pull that trigger, you know. You, right. Once you have that money, it's like you got to spend it properly yeah, and wisely. Yeah, well, I'm actually and, and asking from the point of view of a, I'm a game developer, not a composer. And yes. So um, we're currently at the point where we're um, wanting to hire a composer and where, or actually, well, before that, we're. That's a get, very dangerous thing to say in this room. Currently <laughs> 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 looking for money from a producer so that we can then. Right. right. Um, okay. So. Um, in, in scheduling out our budget, we don't yet have a conversation with the composer to understand what the style of the music would be, so it's very hard for us to kind of understand yes. necessarily what amount of budget to put in. Like, sure. Like, this is the kind of place we're in now if you have any suggestions. Uh, having a conversation with whoever you pick about scope, you know, what your game needs to achieve. Is it electronic music? If so, you know, uh, what implications are there with that sort of, like, does the composer need a mixing engineer? Uh, because they can't mix music themselves. For example, um, you know, we, we hired mixing engineers for both of these. Or, well, in that case, the producer mixed his own music for, for Necrobarista. However, with Florence, we got a different person. Yeah. There, are, there are certain additional costs that, uh, you know, the idea is to be upfront about it straight up and not forget to say, hey, by the way, we've got to factor in, you know, flights to go to record or right. something like that. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, that's an expensive mistake. Mm. And, um, you know, you don't you don't want to be in a position where uh, where the composer feels like uh, they haven't gotten every every bit of information out of you and vice versa. You right. know, uh, an open sharing of ideas and just having I think a very transparent dialogue. Transparency is pretty key. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope that helps. If, if not, just talk to me after, and I'm happy to. What up? Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, the working with soloists and uh, the musicians. Uh, in Florence, was there a lot of improv, or was it more everything on a page? Um, so I come from a semi-jazz background, um, and so I, I don't think Mason knew that. Sorry, my best friend, one of my good friends is like right there, and he's like, what? You come from a fucking jazz background. <laughs> I played jazz flute, if that counts Honestly, as you didn't him for cello, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I compose, I compose essentially in real time, which is improvising into mm -hmm. logic and then hoping that it, you know, doesn't sound like balls. But um, when it comes to uh, palming that off to, to live musicians to play, I'm very, very specific. Okay. So uh, the cellist had really, really specific instructions and thus hated me throughout the, the day. But it was, it was a good day, but it was like a lot of hard work. And you just see, like, at the end of the day, of no, we need to do it again because you didn't hit that particular accent or that particular dynamic at that level at that time. You see the, the face just drop but um, no they, they wouldn't unless uh, really really specifically instructed they would not improvise cool so like yeah, I suppose that question then goes on sense if, so if you don't work with people who improvise then you have complete ownership of what you've created that's yeah. Un unless you've created it through improv, improv yes yeah. well I mean if you're asking someone to improvise you're basically relinquishing ownership yeah. not ownership in a legal sense yeah, yeah, yeah. ownership in a creative sense you know you're you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of banking on them knowing what they're doing now instead of you knowing you, you knowing what yeah. you're doing. I suppose how do you feel doing. about that? Um, not good. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a control freak, so unless it's someone I really, really trust. For example, uh, Mr. Mason Liebenbund in the front here played a little six-string electric cello on an uh, on anime score of mine recently, and uh, I didn't really need to tell Mason what to do apart from bad guy is bad, make him sound bad, and then, you know, Mason and I can kind of work out the kinks after that. So if you have trust, then you tend to not worry. But if it's, you know, a six hour day and you've got a lot of music to, to record, you want to know, you want to go in all guns blazing, so to speak, and just have everything ready to go. In my, in my personal opinion, that's my approach. Everyone's yeah, going to be different. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes improvisation is better. It's like, oh, it's way better than what I thought. <laughs> Hi. 
Hiya. Hi. Um, Florence at times seemed to be quite a dynamic soundtrack. Was that challenging in a way? Uh, so uh, it is a very dynamic, well, it's a very inter sort of interactive soundtrack uh, for sure. Uh, that was actually predetermined by uh, the uh, uh, lead developer, actually. So that was actually uh, very, very upfront conversations about, okay, we need the gameplay to do this, and we need the music to represent it in this way. For example, the, uh, the video I showed before, the brief was essentially, we need a backing track, and then we need stingers that we can trigger with our gameplay you know, bespoke. Every level in Florence is actually uh, a different sort of type of gameplay. I think it was described as like WarioWare, but with emotions. Uh, so every single, every single level had a different in, uh, sort of interactive sort of shtick, if you will. Uh, some of them were just loops. They didn't need to be anything else. But sometimes, you know, it was, it was, you would say, oh, we need, you know, layer one, two, and three, and it needs to come in at X, Y, and Z. It's like, yeah, that's, that's totally fine. So yeah, it was inherently very, very, very interactive, but that was all a predetermined sort of decision by the creative lead. Uh, as a foreigner, I want to ask the hard questions related to your research process on Necrobarista. What is the best coffee place in Melbourne? <laughs> Oof. Um, not Starbucks, Mason. <laughs> uh, fucking St. Edmunds in Paran. Because that's my local. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I would. <laughs> Last question. Yes. Hiya. Uh, without wanting to start a fight in a room full of composers, uh, why Logic Pro over other doors? <laughs> uh, actually, that's, that's like the easiest answer. I got taught in it, and I don't want to learn Cubase. <laughs> that's it. <laughs>